another text that is not easy to hear. The good news, it may not be meant for us. Not all of it, anyway. One of the extraordinary things about Jesus is his ability to communicate authentically with different groups of people. The Pharisees, followers of John the Baptist, people who are Jewish, people who don't follow Jewish customs. He even manages to communicate with the disciples who are an incredibly diverse and eclectic group. And today we find Jesus speaking specifically to Peter. Although the text is somewhat ambiguous, at the very least, Peter feels called out. He asked Jesus, are you telling this parable to us or to everybody? It's pretty clear Jesus is speaking in a way that Peter will understand. Remember that Peter's name literally means rock. He's stubborn. Some would say arrogant. He's reactive and he's prone to violence. He's the one who cuts off the ear of the guard when uh, Jesus is threatened. He's also a leader, someone who's uh, in Jesus's circle who people look to. When we keep that in mind, Jesus's response to Peter's question is a bit more clear. So Peter says, are you telling this story to us or to everyone? And Jesus doesn't answer him directly, but he does say, who is the faithful and wise manager who the master put in charge of the other servants? Right? It's no way that, there's no way that Peter doesn't take that personally and immediately assume that Jesus is talking about him. Peter is a leader. For Catholic and Orthodox folks, he's the leader, right? He's, he's the bishop, the start of the church. Whether you believe that that's who Jesus appointed to continue the church or not, we know that Peter believes he's in a position of authority. He tries to walk on water to literally follow Jesus. He's one of two disciples that traveled up the mountain with Jesus uh, to witness the transfiguration. He's the one that Jesus sends ahead to prepare the Passover feast, the Last Supper. And he's often the first to jump in when Jesus asks questions. He's also the disciple, uh, along with John, who the authorities view as the leader of the disciples. Now, Peter and John are the ones who are brought before the Sandi Sanhedrin, the council of elders, to account for their connection to Jesus and his teachings. So while Jesus doesn't answer Peter directly, I imagine Peter would certainly assume that Jesus is talking about him when Jesus describes both this faithful and wise manager of the servants as well as the manager who gets impatient, acts out with violence, and becomes intoxicated. Oh, and ultimately gets chopped into pieces. <laughs> ah, I don't know about you, but this parable does not do much for me other than terrify me. I don't respond well to fear and violence as tactics for communication. But you know who does? Peter. I know it's hard not to generalize this passage and assume that it's speaking to all of us in this moment in our lives. And I don't wanna assume either that it's not speaking to some of us. It certainly wasn't said for our benefit though. Notice in 50, uh, verse 54, it says, Jesus then turned to the crowd. All right, so the pieces before about managers beating slaves and being torn into pieces, those are said in the language of Peter which is direct and forceful and in your face. And that may be what we need to hear today, but it also may not be meant for us. Um, unless you're also a stubborn and direct leader who's comfortable with metaphors that include a lot of violence, in which case it may be exactly what you need to hear today. The words we need to hear today from this scripture are not gonna be the same for all of us. Jesus was the kind of leader who understood that folks respond differently to different ways of communicating and different motivations. He was able to show up and speak to folks with just the right words and tone that would break through to them on that day and in that moment. At the moment we have a snapshot of in today's scripture, 
is a moment where Jesus is using some violent imagery to get Peter's attention. It's worth noting that just moments before, Jesus is telling the whole group of disciples not to worry. In verse 24, he says, consider the ravens. They don't sow or reap. They don't have a barn in which to store their food. And yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than the birds? You can't add a single hour to your life by worrying. So why are you wasting your life with worry? Relax. God will take care of you. So if we were to read between the lines, we can imagine that Jesus is responding to a situation in which the disciples are, are demonstrating some level of anxiety. The kind of direct and violent speech that Peter gets, I'm guessing would not be ideal for comforting that anxiety. So instead, Jesus encourages them, reminds them how much God takes care of the birds and how beloved they are, about how no amount of worrying is going to change the results of the future. It is a very different approach. Jesus tells the disciples as a group, don't worry, relax. God is with you. God is taking care of you. On the other hand, Jesus tells <laughs> Peter, you better worry and be vigilant or you'll be torn to pieces. To the disciples, he says, peace, do not be afraid. And to Peter, it says, he says, do you think I came to bring peace? I'm not sure where Peter was that he needed to hear that message, but I trust that Jesus had good reasons for pushing him that way. And I know there are probably days where I need to hear this message to get sort of a kick in the behind, to get in gear and do the work that God's calling me to do, despite my fears of division. On those days, this passage may speak to me, but today, uh, Jesus's language really turns me off. I'm not saying that, I, that we should ignore passages like this. I'm still wrestling with this text, but it may not be meant for me today. We can take a lesson from Jesus here and take to heart that people don't all respond to the same style of communication. It's actually irresponsible and even selfish for us to assume that folks will listen and respond to words that are spoken in a language that's native to us. And I don't just mean English or our native language. I'm talking about the customs and the way of speaking, the way that we've interacted based on how we were brought up and how old we are now, or young in the case of Chuck. I would never preach on Sunday morning, for example, with the same tone and style that I produce TikTok videos, right? TikTok's a social media platform where you have these kind of one minute videos. The messages that I share on TikTok about Christianity and the messages in church, they don't conflict. I'm sharing the word of God in both places, but the audiences are very different. Predictably, the videos that do well on TikTok do not necessarily go over well with church folks. Um, and videos that I make that do appeal to folks who are 50 and up are pretty much ignored and rejected by people under 30. <laughs> my, my latest video about vaccines, for example, which I played part of uh, last week, the you know vaccination day based on Frozen, um, it went viral among my mom's golfing friends and her church buddies, okay? So it went viral, not in my typical community <laughs> for TikTok videos, but it is the least popular video I've ever made on TikTok. All right, so while my mom and her friends are calling me and saying, we love this so much, the folks on TikTok are just scrolling past saying, this is irrelevant to us. And, and for a lot of them, it is. Honestly, most of them probably won't get the vaccine till late summer, maybe early fall. And a ton of my followers are under 16 and don't even qualify to get a shot yet. Um, so, wow, well, video about the vaccine, we don't care. So it didn't surprise me that it flopped on TikTok. Videos that go super viral on TikTok, on the other hand, have even millions of views, confuse or just do not land with the 50 and up crowd. Um, 
or they embarrass them. <laughs> but sometimes the exact same message, the exact same message will delight one audience and horrify the other. The latest example, I, brought, I bought this blonde wig. Some of you have seen it. It's like a cute little blonde bob, okay? Several folks over 50 loved it, including folks here. And thank you for all of your compliments and the suggestions that I would look good as a blonde. That was very nice of you, <laughs> adorable. But if you're under 30 and you saw me in that same wig, you knew that it was meant to be terrifying and you were horrified by it. Because for the under 30 crowd, the blonde Bob um, immediately calls to mind this stereotype, often referred to as a, a Karen, even though I love the Karens here. There's a stereotype of someone called a Karen who's an entitled and racist middle-aged woman who calls police on people of color when they're doing things like walking through the neighborhood holding a cell phone. The kind of person that calls the manager uh, when her coffee's not hot enough and threatens to sue or uh, insists on calling corporate when someone tells her she has to wear a mask. So I did buy the wig to portray that particular villain that I could use as a foil for a progressive message. So I was shocked when anyone thought this wig was attractive. <laughs> But I realize it just, it doesn't land the same because we don't have the same, we're not swimming in the same cultural soup. And that's okay. It just shows that a lot can be missed in translation. And that when we're reading a text like Jesus's words to Peter today, it's worth considering, is this word meant for me today? And if not, can I set aside my ego and my discomfort uh, which I experience a lot of when Jesus is talking about beating slaves, okay? Can I set aside my ego and discomfort aside long enough to realize that this word may be meant for someone else, even in a different time, and certainly who's in a different place in their lives? Can we be supportive of folks who are sharing messages that we don't understand and maybe even don't like? I, I really don't like this passage at all. I don't get it. I don't get why Jesus uses violent imagery. The level of power and control in the relationship between the master and the slaves is problematic and is antithetical to who I believe Jesus and the kingdom of God is. But I can still love and support Jesus and his ministry, even though I don't understand. It's, it's the same when we share the word of God in our communities. Right, TikTok videos are not meant for Sunday morning worship goers. Y'all have been super supportive anyway, even when you don't understand it. And my TikTok followers, to their credit, also tell me they are so thankful that you are here on Sunday morning and that churches like this exist, even though coming to a physical church like ours or a Zoom service on a Sunday morning appeals to them not at all, does not appeal to them. We can support both ministries and see the results of God's word taking root, even when we don't understand the culture. And millennials and Gen Z folks, on the whole, this may be shocking to you. They don't want to come to church in a building. They, they don't. I have 66,000 followers on TikTok. None of them are here. Right? They're huge fans who come to every live stream I do, every youth group event I do online. They like and comment and engage with every single video. They participate in our Discord chat online. They're not going to come to Sunday morning church. We would welcome them. Certainly. I have no doubt y'all would be so welcoming if TikTok kids came to church. But we have to acknowledge that the way we do church is designed for the people who are here. And the folks who are here have a particular way of engaging. We do things like coffee hour, that for Gen Z, Gen Z is like under 25, uh, is horrifying for most of them. <laughs> Small talk, ah, right? We do potlucks when we're not in a pandemic. 
We use a style of language and we make cultural references that are appropriate to our lives and that match our ages. And we sit for an hour and listen to what I consider to be beautiful music. <laughs> I also am an, an, an anomaly in my age group and that I grew up in the church. Y'all are still here, <laughs> which I'm thankful for, right? And I believe that that's because this ministry that we're doing here is feeding people. But just as Jesus' words to Peter won't communicate God's love and challenge all of us, attending a church like ours in person or over Zoom is not going to communicate God's love to all people in all places and all generations. It, it may be helpful to know, folks in my generation, I, I really am the anomaly. Fewer than 30% of uh, people in the United States my age and remember the United States, there's like a lot of part of the United States that's very religious. Less than 30% of us go to church. Less than 30%, that's, or, or a religious service of any kind. Church is not the default Sunday morning activity anymore. And I'm on the old, old, old end of millennial, okay? So when you get into Gen Z, there are even fewer folks that are going to church. And that's not just mainline Protestant churches. I right? don't let your evangelical friends convince you that they have a vibrant youth and children's ministry program. They may, but their churches are also shrinking. Um, the the in-person experience of church, it's across the board. It's not just us. Electric guitars and pop music don't get millennials and Gen Z folks into church. There's more to it than that, right? Church isn't the language that they're comfortable speaking, the way we do it anyway. Religiosity is down across the board. If you measure, if and only if you measure re religiosity by church attendance, this is where we get into trouble. It's when we assume that Gen Z should be showing up here. There are 66,000 followers just of me on TikTok and the hashtag progressive Christianity, you put a hashtag after something to kind of like a, a signal people that what the video is about and then they can go and search a word like progressive Christianity and they'll find all the progressive Christian videos. Um, over the last year, we've developed an online progressive Christian ministry and those progressive Christian videos have over 81 million views. 81 million views. The majority of those views are from Gen Z. So why aren't they coming to church? We're doing church on TikTok. Tons of them have asked about the church. They're curious about in-person church. They think it sounds great for other people, why aren't they coming to church? That's the wrong question to ask. We need to stop asking, how do we get young people in the door? As a self-centered way of doing ministry, how can we bring them to us, right? What can we do better so that they'll come to us? What marketing can we do? What hip music can we incorporate? What programs can we add that will bring them to us? Why aren't they in our church doing things our way? That's not the right question. The question we should be asking is how can we bring God's word to them in their language, in a format that is safe and comfortable where they can explore the issues that matter to them? Because I can guarantee they're different, right? The issues that are most central, that we're most preoccupied by at 14 are different than when we're 91 or 55, or you know what I mean? Question is how can we support the ministry that they are already doing in their context? And there is a lot of ministry happening. How can we go to them and back them up with our resources, including our wisdom? Well, we've already done something to start. We, as the Church of the Good Shepherd, do have a vibrant online youth ministry. It's not visible to a lot of us. Uh, I do look forward to getting more of you involved when we're back in person. 
But just know for now that your support of me makes a world of difference. I know that y'all don't all aren't all on TikTok. In fact, I, <laughs> I don't expect any of you to get on TikTok. It is not, I find it entertaining and fun. However, the messages there are not designed. They're designed for Gen Z, right? None of us is Gen Z here that I can see. I don't know. Ivan may still even be a millennial. Yeah, no, Ivan's Gen Z, okay. Regardless. <laughs> The message that I share on TikTok isn't meant for you, but it is shared on your behalf and on behalf of Church of the Good Shepherd and on behalf of the Church Universal. It's not, however, presented in a language that you will always like or understand. And if you get something out of it, I know some of you watch, Lainey and, and <laughs> Julie, I see you're at the top of my screen. You guys watch the TikToks on Facebook and you're so sweet to say nice things. If you get something out of it, that's great, right? If we get something out of Jesus's words to Peter, fantastic. But I'm not sure they were meant for us. Just like this sermon is not written for Gen Z. We can take a note from Jesus and later the Apostle Paul who never lamented that the Colossians and the Galatians and the Ephesians didn't come worship in the synagogues in Jerusalem. And they never said, hey, you know what? We should create a Galatians group at our synagogue so that Galatians will come to our synagogue in Jerusalem. But then while also insisting that the Galatians and everyone else adopt Jewish culture and traditions and worship in the way that the Jewish people were accustomed to. That wasn't the expectation. Jesus and the disciples and Paul, they all traveled to where people were. And they, they talk about eating the food of the place that is served to them. That is radical, by the way. At the time, to eat food that wasn't kosher violated your religious law. But Jesus says it's more important to go into people's homes and receive their hospitality and try to learn their customs. Don't expect them to come to you and adopt the customs you grew up with. For them, that meant walking and sailing different places and learning local vocabulary and customs in order to proclaim God's good news in a manner that people could understand. To connect with young people, we're traveling to TikTok and Discord where we have a progressive Christian chat group. Who knows where we'll go next and what part you may enjoy playing in that. It's always changing, but it's wonderful that we support each other in leaving the walls of the church. I will say not everyone is called to do youth ministry. Let me be very clear about that. If you're not called to it, don't go you know, out and hang out with youth and try to do youth ministry without any preparation or go hang out with any group that you wanna reach with God's word. It, it takes preparation and time and learning and listening. But we can support each other in one another's call, whatever that might be. Whoever you are reaching with God's message of love, even if you don't understand, you know, like Mar Mara Lee may be communicating, well, she's communicating with other churches. I may not understand the way she's marketing things to certain people, but I don't have to because I know she's doing God's work. And I love her as a member of our body of Christ. So you don't have to understand TikTok, but I really appreciate that you're loving me and supporting this ministry. Our text today ends with a beautiful metaphor that I think captures this, a key aspect of our role in doing ministry to people outside of our comfort zone, but especially to future generations. In this parable, a man is frustrated that a tree isn't bearing fruit and the young sapling isn't behaving in the way that the farmer expected. He says, cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? And the other man said, hold on, let me dig around it. Let me fertilize it. Let's watch to see if it bears fruit then before you cut it down. We have the opportunity to nurture each other's ministries, even when we don't understand them. To fertilize and nurture and support younger Christians 
who's who may bear fruits that don't look the way we expect. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't also remember to keep doing church in the way that feeds us, coming home to a place that nurtures us and who we are so that we have the, the capacity to go out and do work on behalf of others. It doesn't mean that when people are communicating differently that we should give up on them just means that we need to go. Once we're filled up spiritually and feel connected in community, we need to go where they are to pay attention to what they need, work with them where they are, offer our own wisdom if it is sought, and then watch them bear fruit and grow into God's love in ways that will long outlast our need for them to be just like us. Amen.